Welcome to Roll Radio. Today, I'm talking with Nathan of Performante uh, and the social token PCC. Nathan, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here on Roll Radio. And uh, I think we got a couple of things to talk about today. In terms of the creation of PCC, can you give us just a little bit of the initial idea that started you out and kind of what it was you were looking to build? Yeah, so we initially created Performante, our social media brand, towards the tail end of 2016. This was a rather turbulent time in the markets and kind of when I was first getting started with cryptocurrency and I was trying to learn about it. There wasn't a lot of good resources online. And then uh, I kind of was seeing a dark and nefarious industry behind the scenes. So I created a simple Instagram page. It was a little bit of an avenue for me to both learn, network, and spread some knowledge myself. And what I found is that there was a very dark network of, I guess we could call it like premium trade groups or mentorship or overall not very wholesome learning material where you would pay half a Bitcoin, $5,000, whatever the price might be, and you would just get access to elementary information. And I even fell for some of these myself. I paid and it was the same kind of stuff you could find on Investopedia. And so that was one of the reasons why I became quote unquote a crypto influencer is because I thought it was an opportunity to fight the good fight and try and spread reliable knowledge as far as possible because I think that is one of the main primary roadblocks that people encounter when trying to learn about cryptocurrencies is not being able to find non-bias reliable information that is both applicable and doesn't suggest you buy uh, 100x leverage and just hope for the best you know hope is not a strategy and luck is not a factor and ultimately we're just trying to provide information that will guide people towards the financial freedom that they may or may not seek by leveraging cryptocurrencies so as a builder of kind of an education platform it's interesting that you don't really monetize any of that education in contrast to kind of what you were seeing in those early days. Yeah, I guess uh, the buzzword that could really be used to describe this would be the democratization and decentralization of financial information, right? So you can go on Instagram, you can go on TikTok, you can sign up for people's premium groups, you can get access to their trades, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, we're trying to make this all free because we think this information should be free. Why share it? What is the advantage that you get by giving it away for free? I think one of the fundamental characteristics of how I identify is an altruistic individual. I think Naval said it best in that you should do for more for others than you do yourself. And if you do so, you will be rewarded, right? So at the end of the day, I know what I know. I'm confident navigating the market. But by offering PCC, by offering a learning platform and trying to democratize this cryptocurrency education, it's allowing me to genuinely help others. And a financial incentive would be nice, but it's not really that necessary because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, crypto is about democratization and leveling that playing field. And I think there's a lot more value in leveling that playing field than hiding behind a paywall of $200 a month or half a Bitcoin for permanent access. To me, that is a very dark, nefarious industry where it's a zero-sum game and ethically, it doesn't ring true with me. When people first come across PCC, what's the kind of entry point where they start learning about how to trade, how to, how to get into this ecosystem, uh, how do they get their feet wet? Yeah, so I think that kind of comes down to our social media reach. We have Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and that's kind of a funnel where all we try and drive everyone into our Discord. And when people first get started in our Discord, there's basically a simple set of instructions. Download the Roll Wallet. Here's your first airdrop. And that very first airdrop is for one PCC. And with that, you gain access to analysis from me and my partner, Keith, who try and provide some market commentary for both crypto and the larger indices, because we are passionate about macroeconomics, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, and how all of these interact with asset prices. 
this is also where you get access to some basic resources. So we try not to overwhelm people with that 40 hours of video training that we detailed earlier. We try and keep it light with very introductory level. So the, the introductory information is designed to introduce the ideas, but not overwhelm. And then as people engage within the Discord more, they get airdrop more PCC, and that allows them to kind of climb the ladder of what information they have access to. But at the end of the day, it kind of all starts with checking out our social media pages and then getting involved in our Discord as the funnel, so to speak, and how to get involved and engage with the PCC ecosystem. How do you separate the sort of social media meme action versus kind of the fundamentals of an investment in crypto? Yeah, that, 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 that's the biggest question of them all, right? So what makes a meme coin a meme coin is a black and white in a gray world compared to what makes an actual project. Uh, so if we look back at like 2016, 2017, we saw the ICO craze where all of these big crypto companies, let's call it, were releasing tokens, massive ambition, and ultimately never delivered on their projects. So one that comes to mind is Request Network, REQ. At ICO 2016, pumped, it was like, oh, this is going to be the payment rails for all e-commerce. This is the team so promising. It's got limitless potential. And then uh, six years later in 2022, they still don't have a functioning prototype. And so it's not classified as a meme coin. It's classified as a legit project. But I think the only thing that would classify a meme coin as a true meme coin would uh, having profanities in the name, whether it be a uh, blank coin or blank rocket or uh, any kind of non PG 14 word in it, I think particularly articulates it as a meme coin. And the other thing, comparing to the ICO craze that we saw in 2016 to the meme coin craze that we saw in around this time, 2021, was the addition of hyper deflationary aspects where it's like, oh, we're burning 10% of the transaction or 5% gets redistributed, right? Like inherently, they're just trying to paint the picture that holding the token is valuable when in reality, we know that's not the case. So the trick there in both cases is really to look at the fundamentals of what's the realistic use case, what's the underlying upside of the project, and what's the reputation of the people on board versus what are they doing to economically manipulate the price of the coin? Yeah, but just a basic level of due diligence. I mean, there was even one recently called Fluffy Coin, and this was made by a, a funny guy on TikTok. And all over the website, it says, please don't actually buy this. And then lo and behold, it pumped like 20,000% in three days or something stupid like that, reached a market cap of 100 million before it went to near zero, right? Like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. If anything is going to cause a coin to skyrocket, it's telling people not to buy it. Like, that's a human condition. They're always going to do what you tell them not to, even if it's not in their best interest. Is it more fun to trade when it's a little bit more volatile? I mean, obviously it's fun when it's just going up and up and up because that's an exciting kind of dopamine releasing feeling, but it feels like you have to use a little bit more of that skill set that you've developed in a time when things are a little flatter, a little bit more up and down. When it's straight bull season, you can basically not advising that you throw risk management out the window, but most people do. And then whenever we reach lo a local top or like when, for example, Elon tweeted that Tesla was going to remove Bitcoin from their payment system, that's when the importance of risk management comes back into the spotlight and people are often humbled. I think there's long periods of time like we've seen in the past where risk management is not as important, but like we're seeing with this intense volatility now, this is when people really get punished and begin to hand all that crypto that they earned back to the exchanges when they get the fabled, you have been liquidated email. How did you get into this and, and what about it is so enjoyable for you that you're willing to spend not only our time on it, but educating others around it? I think what got me specifically into cryptocurrency was the Bitcoin standard. I read that book, absolute classic, recommend it to anyone and everyone that's getting involved in the space because it is such a great like wormhole entry point. It teaches you about macroeconomics. It teaches you about the fundamental science of Bitcoin and how that intersects with our financial systems. And so that really is what turned me into a Bitcoin max, so to speak, 
was I read that book in 2016 and I was like, yo, this, this is the playbook for success. The infrastructure of the economy has drastically changed so much that people our age have a very different set of tools to become wealthy. And that was kind of how I conceived Bitcoin is there was, there's only, every generation has an opportunity. And as of right now, we have extremely cheap debt, rising inflation, and we have an ability to hedge against it with truly sound money. And so recognition of the trend in 2016 by reading the Bitcoin standard is kind of what sucked me down the rabbit hole. And just to quote uh, the Red Queen, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay still. And since then, it basically became an arms race of, okay, I am going to speculate that Bitcoin will be the wave of my generation. How can I get more exposure, not only to this asset, but to the industry? So in 2016, as you discovered Bitcoin and sort of the underlying premise of this asset, what about that made you want to kind of not only invest and kind of double down and like... Like, how did, how did you see it differently than some of your peers at that time? My dad, he actually got rug pulled by Enron back in the day. A classic uh, financial example of not how to do accounting. And uh, that was one example that I, I specifically remember the day that Enron rug pulled. Another one is that uh, he owned a lot of oil stocks after the 08 boom. And so, and Bloomberg was always on the TV And so I think that kind of primed my exposure to the financial markets to the point where I was interested, but I didn't have the means to participate because at that time I would have been like 14 years old, not, not an appropriate age to be opening up a leverage account per se. But I think that primed my awareness of financial markets. And then when 2016 came by, I guess I was quote unquote subconsciously looking for an opportunity. And when I saw Bitcoin, it was very enticing, very engaging. And of course, there's always that like opportunity for financial reward, right? Like you're not going to engage and dedicate yourself to a craft or spend all the time on something that's not going to benefit you. Everyone's seen like, oh, if you bought $100 worth of Bitcoin in 2010, you'd have this much money. And at the end of the day, the longer you're in the market, the longer you have an opportunity to succeed like that. Because potentially, the, if the amount of money on planet Earth is limitless in a fiat-based economic system, then the value of assets is infinite. As you were building this knowledge and investing in cryptocurrencies, you also started building community around this idea. Yeah, it was kind of an avenue to educate myself, like I said earlier, and try and educate others by getting more involved in the space. Um, PCC was also one of the first crypto discords to launch. And I remember when I first made it, I had other crypto influencers message me like, like, isn't Discord for gaming? And now lo and behold, a couple of years later in 2022, we're seeing Discord as the heart of Web3. And so I think, I mean, it's a well-known fact within economic pedagogy that the best way to learn is by teaching. And so obviously you have to have a basic level of understanding before you engage in that kind of behavior. Um, But like Naval says, if you have to memorize, then you don't understand. So if you're able to explain to other people the ideas that you have in your head, then clearly you have a firm understanding of what you're trying to teach. And that was kind of one of the key concepts behind getting involved in crypto is, look, I'm gonna dive in, I'm gonna test the, the depth of the river with both feet, and we're gonna see what happens on the other side. How much of the work that you're doing has paid off in in terms of the community that you've built? I mean, are you making kind of personal friendships there? Are people important to your life that are in that discord? Like how how has that developed over time? Yeah, I think we have a really wholesome community. Like we have a, a great core group of people. We always say good morning to each other, get that good morning chain going. Because I think there, especially in this day and age where we've seen globalization and digitalization take over, there is a very strong ten, very strong trend towards social isolation. I mean, I'm a prime example. Like I, I have friends in real life, but I spend most of my time in my basement, on my computer. And so fundamentally, we're subscribed to hustle culture. 
where people are working 80, 90 hours a week, whether it be self-represented or for another business. And so I think fundamentally, there's a lot of value in having a social network where people are there to support each other, bounce ideas off of each other. And that's one idea that we've adopt adopted in our Discord where a lot of people have actually formed a joint ventures together because it's like, hey, let's execute this on this idea. We think it has a lot of potential. And in that essence, it's become an incubator not only for financial success, but for business ventures and social connections. Because I think that we live in an environment where there is a lot of negative space and there's a lot of lack of genuine human connection just because of the technology invasion that we've seen within our lives. Yeah, it feels like social media and the algorithms that power them tend to highlight a lot of negative energy in the culture. And it's interesting to see with Web3, we haven't seen quite as much of the algorithm side on our social interactions. And so you can find these pockets of a little bit more of that kind of real community building and and wholesome interaction. Yeah, exactly. I, I really agree with that. There's a book that I'm reading right now called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari. And that's one of the key ideas. It was just released in January 2022. And he talks about how these big tech companies, whether it be Facebook, Google, Twitter, are, are mortally harming our attention by harvesting us for revenue and that is implications not only for their bottom line but how we engage with each other and not covered in the book but i'm a believer in that the decentralized network the peer-to-peer -peer web3 trend is an opportunity to align ourselves together rather than apart because it's a network of peers working on the same thing rather than an algorithm serving up what they think is best and i think that's something that applies to pretty much anyone who launches a social token. You're saying there's an underlying idea here. There's an underlying concept behind the social token that somebody has to believe in in order to want it, whether they're earning it, trading it, buying it, whatever it is. And so as we look at these different launches of social tokens by different creators and brands and DAOs and organizations, what we're really doing is we're aligning our own beliefs with these groups. Yeah, and I think that was one of the key ideas of the role platform that I was really engaged in when I first came across it. It was suggested to um, suggested to us by a member of our Discord, actually. His name is Taiku. Big shout outs to him if he's listening. And so that was one of the, the major ideas is that social tokens are completely new undiscovered, uncharted territory. And what it allows is very important because it allows for a higher level of gauge, engagement between the creator and the community. And before we only saw this infrastructure in the traditional markets, like you said, by literally making yourself a publicly traded company and having that accountability. But this is the blockchain version of that where it's much more streamlined, much more interpersonal and allows for a higher fidelity engagement between the two parties. And that is one of the most interesting things that I find about social token is that yeah, okay, there's tokens that can be traded, they're tied to a community, but what it actually represents and its inherent value proposition is usually non-financial based fundamentally, right? It's a social token. It's not, it's not like a, a stable coin where it's backed by the amount it has in reserve. What a social token is valued at is intangible. It's based in how, in, in how well the community performs, in its ideas, its contribution, and overall having a non-tangible financial asset and its ability to be traded to, to move between users is super powerful as we're talking about the decentralization and adoption of Web3 technologies. I think it's an incredibly subversive idea in web three we're so used to everything being based on the price chart and pricing and watching you know the numbers go up and down and to say that the actual value of something like a social token is not wholly based on that number or that the number doesn't represent the full value of that kind of messes with people a little bit but i i absolutely believe that's true and and i think it's why some communities, they can work with relatively small numbers of people and, and some, you know, and, and then the social token can allow that to kind of scale up. Um, there's, not a, there's not one way that a social tokenized community works.
So I guess my question to you that you deal with so many social token communities and you're the host of Roll Radio, so you've had this conversation with many unique communities. What do you see as the unique aspects of PCC, the core value proposition? Like, What is your perspective on what we're trying to do with this project and how it fits in with cryptocurrency adoption? What I'm seeing is a general trend that is education of uh, community members. And whether that's happening kind of top down or whether that's happening peer to peer, there's a, there's a different sense of community in social token communities because they're all trying to learn together and they're all trying to value this thing together. Some of them don't know exactly what they're doing. They're, it, it's experimentation and it's trying things out. Some of them have very clear path on what they want to do with their token. Uh, but in both cases, the community members themselves are the full range of never held crypto in any way before, all the way to you know deeply DeFi trading, you know um, crypto natives on on the other side. And what I love to see is the social token creates an incentive for all of those people to work together. And as you were saying, it's kind of this uh, this strange thing of creating this kind of helpful and wholesome community within these little pockets of discord. I think there's something about all of these smaller levels of communication happening where it's not being exposed to the outside world. It's not it's not hidden. Anyone can join, but because only the self-selecting few do, it has that feeling of being a little bit more open and earnest that we're lacking in a lot of that big social media where we're just trying to get, you know, their metrics, the the like or the retweet. Um, whereas what I'm trying to do on a Discord is I'm really trying to answer your question. And I'm really trying, I'm not trying to just get something that's going to get retweeted because it's like a sick burn, you know? I'm trying to really like answer and and participate in a conversation with the people there. Yeah, it's kind of a deeper level of engagement that we've seen previously. And I think it's fundamentally one of the biggest difference between web two and web three is the wholesomeness to it. If wholesomeness is an adjective that can be applied, then I think it's very, it encapsulates what the overall trend is about. Happy to have opportunities to engage with other people and talk about it. I would encourage anyone who's curious to dive into the discord of PCC. Nathan, I want to thank you so much for joining and talking about all this with us. Definitely enjoyed the chat and I'm looking forward to both how far and how how much PCC will develop in the future and how much value the larger team at Roll can provide within the social token ecosystem as we head towards this never ending trend of digitalization. Awesome. I'll see you in the Discord. Talk to you soon.